Welcome to the StoryCraft Cafe. Come in, grab a cup of your favorite beverage, and get ready to join the storytelling conversation. StoryCraft Cafe is brought to you by Dabble, the ultimate cloud-based fiction writing software. Here we're going to bring together storytellers from all walks to encourage and empower you to craft your best story. Welcome in to the StoryCraft Cafe podcast. Do you love fantasy novels? I know I do, and Brent Weeks has for several years now been one of my favorite fantasy authors from his Lightbringer series that I then uh, discovered his previous series, which he has now returned to with a brand new book. We're going to talk to Brent today about writing fantasy, about deciding when it's time to revisit a series to, you know, these worlds and characters that you've created. We're really going to pick the brain of a great fantasy writer who is in the game today. Join us this Thursday live at 11 a.m. Central Time. That's uh, noon Eastern and you know, figure out the time zones from there. Uh, but we're going to have a live chat also with fantasy and sci-fi writer Christopher Paolini. You can find details over at storycraft.cafe. Join us live or listen to the replay here on the podcast. Thanks for listening. And we are live here in the Storycraft Cafe. My apologies. We had a couple of uh, technical glitches there for just a second, but I think we're here now. I am Hank Garner, your co- your host, as always. And I'm, today I'm super excited to have Brent Weeks on the show with me. Brent, it's it's been a couple of years since we got a chance to chat, but got a brand new book out uh, hey. just a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, what a what a better time. Uh, to get to catch up than over a new book. How are you, buddy? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I, uh, as you said, it's been a couple of years. It takes me, it takes me a couple of years. I, <laughs> I tend to write these, these big chunky fantasy novels and I keep promising myself, I'm going to write shorter books and, you know, I'm going to write a shorter book and <clears throat> never happens, never happens. So is that, so a, it's been a couple of years since I had an excuse, but thanks for having me back. It's always, is, always a pleasure to chat with you. Is that uh, lying to yourself? Uh, what what do you call that when you keep promising yourself to write shorter books? And yeah, yeah, and, um, <laughs> just, just I'm just a slow learner. I think uh, it's like I, I told myself I was going to write this, but I think part of it is because I, after finishing a big project, which most of my projects are big, I always go, you know what? Let's let's bite off something a little smaller because <laughs> that was rough. That was hard to do. <laughs> let's do something easy next, and then I think, well, I'll I'll do a I'll do a shorter book, and that will, um, you know, makes editing and everything like take half as long when the book right. is only half as long and takes the writing about half as long. And so that sounds like almost like a vacation. It's like, okay, I'll do what I love, but it'll be easy this time. <laughs> And and this time I'd really fooled myself. I had a I had a bet with John Scalzi, and because he uh, years ago he asked what you know what I was doing once I was done with Lightbringer, and I said you know I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to the Night Angel world, and I'm gonna write a short book, you know, and 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 he just <laughs> laughed at me, and he's like, no, you won't, you you epic fantasy guys, you never go back, and I was like, yes, we do. I'm like, I'm a very disciplined artist and I can, I can, if I take on that challenge, I will make a shorter book. So he's like, okay, okay, how short? And I'm like, oh crap, <laughs> uh, 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 125,000 words, you, you know? And he's like, yeah, so the average novel, you, you know, length is like 80,000 words, you know, but okay, fine, fine. 125,000 words is, is short. And so he said, okay, so let's, let's make a bet on it. So, so we both ponied up you know, as much as we could manage. And that, that was $5. And, um, and We're so I've been having this voice of John Scalzi mocking me in my head for the last, uh, last two plus years. And, and I'm having to give him his five bucks, unfortunately, because, because I, I just barely, <laughs> just barely scraped over the 125,000 words with 315. So, 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 I was about to say Night Angel Nemesis is uh is considerably longer than the first trilogy. Yes. I, 
what what was the average size of those first three books? So so those were um, 155,000, 155,000. It just happened that way. I wasn't aiming for that exact word count. Um, and then 170,000 for the last one. So so yes, this one was was more than double the the first two Night Angel books, and so that's why it took a little while. I I I, uh, I still have a pretty good writing speed. It's just the yeah. it's just the total length is is large. Wow. I, I even had a I even had a, a space in the middle where there's a, there's a mid book pinch, yeah. and I I you know I like I tend to think of these things one structurally. Of, of having action sequences and way, you know, th- th- to, to fit the structure together. But also I know that um, they split the books in certain languages. So when this goes yeah. into German, they always split the books because German adds 30% to the length. And so that's when you get great. a book that's, you know, 400,000 words, it's like, they, they just can't like literally it won't physically be bound without just breaking. So they, they tend to split longer books. Plus I just can't make any money on, on, you know, these monsters. Um, <clears throat> So I knew I knew that they'd be splitting the book. So I was like, okay, well, I have this place. Okay, right. you know, it's it's at about one fifty, and that's a reasonable book size. And I, and I was like, I I sort of think it's one full book. I think it should be together, but I know the Germans are going to split it. So so you know, I sort of presented it to my to my agent and my editor, and they're both like, no, I think it's one book. It needs to be one book. So I I appreciated that from them because I felt like that um, you know showed some artistic integrity, which yeah. is not a thing that people expect out of, out of, you know, New York, out of, out of big businesses, which publishing is, you know, kind of a big business. So, so I like that. I like that they did that, that they went with, they're like, well, this feels like a whole story. This has got an artistic yeah. unity. Let's keep it together. And so oh, that's what we did. Writing is, uh, is the strange mix of, of artistry and commerce and the commerce allows us to, be involved in the artistry and it's it's these this yin and the yang the push and the pull of you know um making it all work together and um you know anyone who can pull it off and and still you know have their soul at the end of the day i, I think that's a pretty good accomplishment it is it is and and you know we, we had a lot of uh you know we had a lot of conversations about how do we <clears throat> like like First, it was just like, well, how do I how do I write this book? And and I I wanted to do new things, and it was like, right. okay, I, I want to, I don't want to write the same book over and over. That's just not who I am as as an artist. I want to take on new challenges. I had had this long term vision after I wrote Night Angel of like stories I wanted to tell in this world and how it all hooked together. But I didn't want to make promises because I was like, okay, I'm a first time writer with Night Angel. I, I don't want to make these huge promises about you know, a 12 book series or something yeah. right out of the gate. Uh, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I don't know what I'm doing. So, um, <clears throat> so I wrote, uh, I, I knew that what I wanted to write in the night angel world, I wasn't ready for yet as an artist. I was just like, I don't have all the skills to do, to do what I want to do in a way that's new and fresh. And that feels like me rather than feels like somebody else or, you know, copying some other epic fantasy writers or whatever. So, I, I said, I need to go write Lightbringer first and sort of cross train. And so I, I, having done that, coming back to this world, it's like, okay, now I want to write, um, I want to write a novel with Kyler Stern as the main character. So he is the main character in the night angel trilogy. I want to continue the story on. Well, now how, how do we, how do we sell this? Like, it's like, okay, it's one thing to tell the story. I, I decided to, to write it in first person, you know, present tense, much of it is in present tense. Uh, eventually there's a, there's a frame story that gets introduced and, and I do some of these you know, slightly more literary things that I, that I right. introduce kind of slowly enough. I think that you can kind of figure out what's going on if you haven't read books very much that have those sort of things. Um, but it was sort of like, okay, so I've got this book that's different, but has some of the same characters. And now how do we introduce that to readers? And we had some conversations about that. It's like, okay, is this Night Angel 4? It's like, well, I, I don't think it's exactly Night Angel 4. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty different, even though it is Kyler Stern. And so we, we decided um, to sort of roll out a little bit of the, of the master plan, uh, uh, which is, okay, so what I'm writing now, and so I've just been telling fans this, you know, kind of now in the last few weeks and whatever, is 
the Kakari Codex is the whole series. And so the first movement of the Kakari Codex was the Night Angel trilogy. And that's trilogy. It stands by itself, you know, it stands alone. Like right. there's, there's a finish to the story and you can be done there. Like and obviously even, even book one could stand on its own. Yes. Yes. Which, which was very deliberate. I, I yeah. really wanted to, like, I felt <laughs> as a reader, I felt sometimes trapped into epic fantasy series. Like, okay, that book sucked, but I like some of the earlier books, but I need to see how it ends. And like, yeah. that's not the deal that I want any fan to have from my work. It's like, well, that book sucked, but I guess I'm stuck. It's like, I, no, like, like the whole point is I give you good story. You give me enough money. I can keep telling you good stories. You, you know, that's yeah. kind of the, like everybody is supposed to win in this thing, or mm -hmm. at least I want fans to feel like, man, I got so much entertainment out of what I bought from Brent Weeks. Like that was a great deal for me. Like right. I really enjoyed that. So, so I did that with, with the first night angel book. And then I did it with the night angel, you know, trilogy. And then, I, and, and then to sort of, to, so the way we're conceptually doing this is, is that this is the second, you know, movement in the Kakari Codex. And this is the Kyler Chronicles. And then there will be a third movement, which is, which will shift again and will shift focus. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm trying to not sell that yet because that's, that's a little ways down the road. <laughs> and, and, and again, I don't want to overpromise. I want to, I want people to be blown away when we get there that yes, I've been working on these things. You know, I've, I've had some plot twists in mind since I was 20 years old and here I am, you know, 25 and I'm still not right. right here. I'm 25. <laughs> Sorry. Here, here I am, you know, 46, 25 right. years later. And, um, and I'm still not going to get to write some of those plot twists for a while. So, so it's sort of like, there is this, in some ways there is this grand plan, but I also want to leave room for myself as, as an artist to tell things in new ways, to do new things and to, to teach readers. Okay. I don't, I just don't spin out the same book over and over. So I hope, I hope they'll come along with me. This is a, you know, a tonal shift and, and yeah. a different way of telling a story that might take a little bit of use, a little bit of getting used to. Um, so, so that's it. Oh, okay. We, we've got questions yeah. coming in. That's great. Samuel said, how many books do you plan to write in the codex? Do you, how do like, do you, I know you, you have a grand vision, but do you have a, a plan for that vision? Yeah. So, so, um, so this is loose. So I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying not to like, even, even when I was talking with my editor, uh, cause with Lightbringer, I'd planned to write a trilogy yeah, <laughs> and, I remember then, that conversation. and then like yeah. right before it came out or before it came out, I, I was like, okay, don't put trilogy on, put series on it. Cause, cause I think it's going to be four books. And they did that in the U S yeah. but in the UK, they never got the memo. So it says, oh, yeah. you know, the first book says trilogy. And so I've been, I've been living that down forever. So, and then of course it went from four to five. So, <laughs> right. Uh, so, so, so yeah, so uh, in this, so I, I said, well, we could call this, you know, that they, they wanted Kyler Chronicles for the, for the second, uh, for the second installment here. And I, and I was like, ah, eh, okay. I, I, I think it's only going to be three. I'm pretty sure it's going to be three. That's how I envision this second movement. And they're like, yeah, let's not put trilogy on that. Just, just in case. <laughs> so, so, they put, so, so, uh, but what I envision is I'm, you know, three for the Night Angel trilogy, three for this. I envision the, the the last series will be longer, so it would not okay. surprise me if that's four or five. But however, like I I also um, like when I finished the Lightbringer series, I I had this I had this thought. I was like, this is incredibly difficult to do to finish a series to like like the amount of just intellectual effort it takes to pull together all the threads. Um, it's it's like taking the SAT every day for for right. three or four years, you know, three years. And it's like, that's not fun to do just to, to make the storylines line up, to make sure that all of the plots, the subplots that you happily introduced nine years ago, that those actually matter, that each character has an impact on the final outcome that you've dealt with everything that kind of, that you raised in ways that look organic or feel, et cetera. Like it's yeah. super, super hard. And I was like, I don't want to be doing that at 70. Like, right. Like, I don't want to get, get into a place where I'm trying to do this stuff that you need 110% of your brain capacity and your fluid intelligence to do when I'm, when I'm old. And like, I got a lot of crystallized intelligence. I got a lot of, I've got a lot of knowledge, but like that thing of like flipping things backwards and being like, if you flip this upside down and stick it together, that works, you know, like, like people yeah. do their best mathematical sort of things when they're young. It's like, right. I think there's some of that, that's that fluid intelligence that you need 
for for certain things to bring things artfully together. They're like, man, I I would like to not be doing some of that stuff uh, when I'm 70 with with a huge series. So I'm trying to uh, make sure that I'm not biting off more than I can chew, so that I end on, on really a on a on a high note, so that I can you know do what I'm setting out to do. I guess. I, I think I'm one of three people on earth who came to your work through the Lightbringer series mm. and then discovered uh, the Night Angel series. Mm-hmm. Um, and the way that I would sell Lightbringer to people is uh, I would tell them it's it's epic fantasy. But if uh, if Green Lantern was in this world, kind of. You know, okay. and um, and and then that would open up a whole conversation where we could really talk about the series. Sure. And sure. um, that uh, I, I just love that series so much. And and my son and I bonded over that series, and he's now nineteen and in college, and we you know we love the series together. Um, but then I, I between uh books three and four, as you were publishing Lightbringer, I think I went and read. The Night Angel mm-hmm. trilogy, the original trilogy, and um, and I love that uh, mm-hmm. the series, and but they are very different series, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I remember when I first met you, um, you you had mentioned that you were going to go back to the Night Angel world because you had more stories there that you wanted to tell. Mm-hmm. What is it about this world that you've now returned to that kept? pulling on you to, to come back and tell more stories there. Oh, it's, I, I mean, in many ways, it's, it's just like your first love. It's like, you never, you never forget, you never forget it. And so there's <clears throat> like, I wondered when I, when I came back, I was like, okay, how is this going to be? And I, I had a scene that I, I like one of the first scenes I tried to write, I had this, this character, Mama K from the original Night Angel right. trilogy. And I was like, okay, well, let's see if I can find her. You know, she's still in here somewhere. Yeah. And I wrote the scene and it was like, oh, she's right there. <laughs> like, like it, it was like, oh, it's like, it's like seeing an old friend, you, you know, from right. college or something. And you're like, there's n- no time has passed. You're like, you're still there and we still know each other and okay, we can get along again. So like, like there was, there was certainly some of that. There was like, um, I love these characters. i had these plans. I wanted, I, I had plans for some of them. Uh, that like, okay, I'm going to see what happens to you when we do this. I'd had other things where I was like, okay, you have a big test coming and I'm not really sure how that's going to go for you. And like, I'm not sure what the truth of the situation and your character, by the time you get to that test, how it's going to, how it's going to shake out. So like, I want to see how you do there and maybe you're going to break my heart or maybe you're going to surprise me and be amazing. So, so I, I sort of, I set up, um, I, 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 have these tentative, I have these strong character arcs and I have these sort of tentative character arcs in my head. And, and I have these, these big trials for characters. Um, and I, I like want to see how we get there because they have um, like characters, not often, but like sometimes they really do surprise me. I mean, like, well, I guess <sighs> sometimes they surprise me in big ways. They're, they're you know, they're frequently yeah. surprising me in small ways or it's just like, okay, I wanted this scene to go this way but that doesn't fit with who she is. Right. I was going to have her ask about this thing, but like, she's not going to ask that of Kyler because right. she doesn't trust that he's going to tell him her the truth. So she's not even going to ask. And it's like, well, dang it. The whole point was that Kyler gets to say this thing. So that, you, you know, then you're juggling and, and you, the, the, the depth of character and characters remain true to themselves. It's always something that's really, really important to me and something yeah. I pride myself on and do a lot of work on. Um, so, so I, uh, um, Gosh dang it! I I I got lost in the weeds there on your original question, so, so you gotta forgive me. Well, I, I was uh, the original question was what was it about this world that oh. that, that pulled? Yeah, yeah. Out? I I I guess some of that was was that discovery. It's that it's that hope to to be with these characters, to take them yeah. to places that that I'd sort of thought. I would be done with by now. Like I thought, okay, I'm going to do this light bringer thing. And then I'll, you know, surely by the time I'm 45, I will have written this big long series set in the night angel world. And, and then I'll be looking for something else to do. And now it's like, well, I've just left these guys hanging. Like, like they've got, they've got stuff. There's work left undone for these people. I, you know, I know who, I know who some of these people's kids are and how the kids, 
you partially turn out. So, so, you know, there's things like that. of like, I need to see you. I need to, I need to do this thing. And there's things about the, the night angel world that are like, I, I took some hard left turns when I decided to write Lightbringer. I was like, I don't want to write the same kind of thing over and over. So let's start with some very different um, world building blocks as I was, as I was building uh, Lightbringer. It's like, okay, we're going to have, we're not starting in the streets. We're starting in the courts. You know, we're not starting with very low magic. We're starting high magic, like magic affects right. everything in this world. We're starting in a different time period. Uh, you, you know, the technology and everything is in a different place. It's a, it's a, you know, it's an early Renaissance world. There's guns and magic together and guns and swords right. and magic together, which is awesome. But this world is, is more, you know, rudimentary and there's less magic and there's, there's more, you know, kind of grit under your teeth because that's where the characters come from. And that's the kind of worlds that they've been dealing with. So there's something about that that I've always loved of just by being like, man, this world is tough. And so in, in Night Angel, it's like that, um, there's this huge sense of, of darkness a lot of times, but there's always this, uh, there's always this hope. There's this light within that, that I think is the brighter because the reality and the, um, the truth of the darkness and, and that like bad things can happen to good people. Right. Like that's acknowledged in this world and you see it and it takes a piece out of people and people have to confront that. And like, we live in a world where people can just boom, get cancer and be dead three months later. And you're just like, what the hell? Why right. them? And, and night angel does that. And because of who the characters are, and, and their jobs, uh, they interact with death a lot. And like, those are, those are really stark questions for us as human beings. And it's like, right. okay, wait, you, you use assassins, uh, you, you know, to, to talk about deep moral issues. It's like, yes, I do. Yeah. Like, like, like that's, <laughs> that's why it's because like they're dealing with death. And like, so right. we want them to have special insights and maybe they don't. And that's super scary. Oh, you, you, you know, it's own, in its own way. So it allowed me to ask kind of different questions like, than, than Lightbringer, which had questions about power and power structures and how people act when they're treated differently and um, and, and lots of that stuff that, that maybe is a little more immediate to some of us uh, in, in a slightly more pampered lifestyle, like perhaps some of us kind of live uh, where where uh, Night Angel is much like much more like, man, you got it. What are you going to do to survive today? And it might surprise right. you. So I, uh, it's, it's like visiting that, that old neighborhood in, in, in my memory. So it's, it's so interesting to me, um, the way that fantasy in particular, um, allows you to wrestle with, um, with ideas and things going on in our real world, but to do it in a way that is removed from, the, the things we're so attached to in the world and and in a lot of ways allows you to um, to see the truth of a thing without being immersed in it, if that makes sense mm -hmm. at all. It's 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 like wrestling through an idea without being without everything counting so much for you in particular is. Do you, do you that's, think that's the fantasy actually, that's actually one of the things I, I really, really love about fantasy is it allows us to. Uh, to wrestle with these questions again without our tribalism, right? Like, like, okay, if you're an American, you're watching this in 2023, you know where you line up or people like you line up on like 50 different subjects. And you're like, well, people like me seem to think that this free trade issue should be put in these terms. And, and that's just how you're going to do it. Cause that's how people like you do it, whether you've thought it through your, for yourself or not. And, and fantasy kind of says, or like reading as a whole says, come here, I'm going to pull you out of your world. I'm going to plug you into a new world and you're going to look at it through these eyes and you're going to see things in ways maybe you never thought. And you read an old book and, and you're like, wow, people are completely blind to some of these you know racial issues or whatever, but they really care about honor or something. And you're like, when's the last time I heard somebody talk about honor when they weren't making a joke? Right. You, you, you know, it's like, wait, but they're really serious about this. This is not a, 
Like, wow, like, like I've stepped into a new world. And um, in some ways, I, I think that breaks us out of uh, a little tyranny of our own time. And it lets right. us, it, it lets, and, and, and a tyranny of our own groups of like, well, I have to think this because everybody that I know thinks this and everybody who's not evil thinks this about this issue. And it puts us in, in somebody else's head and it says, what if things were set up like this? And then what would you think? And this character does this thing. He thinks it's right. You can think differently, even as that character makes like these horrible choices. Like I invite you to like, uh, like one of the things I did with, uh, with the original Night Angel trilogy was there's a really good character who's done good things and paid the price for it. And then in the third book, he slides into evil and he does it by rational steps. And I was hoping that as he does that, like at different points, readers would pull away from him and be like, wait, I think he's a bad guy now, <laughs> or, or at least he's doing stuff that I'm really deeply uncomfortable with. And then I want, I hoped that some readers would reread and be surprised. Like, wait, I was okay when he was massacring people just by his orders off stage. But then when he indulged in sexual violence on stage, that's when I gave up on him. Wait, 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 right. hold on. That makes me, and like, I was actually excusing him because he was my friend, right? Like I was like, no, no, it's okay. He's doing it. He feels bad about it. And he's really trapped. Like I was excusing evil because that was a guy I felt good things about. And that could, should kind of horrify you as a reader. And like, I want to set those things up. I, I, I want to do that. And, and like, that's, that's one of the powers of, of fantasy in particular is I think fantasy pulls you the farthest from your own tribe and it puts you into a completely new world and it trusts you. And it says, okay, be a moral human while you read these people doing things sometimes right, sometimes wrong, and then step away from it and go, gosh, how do I feel about that? What do I think about that? You know, as an individual, maybe I need to go talk to somebody about that. Cause that made me think about things really differently. Like one of the, uh, one of the all time great reviews that I, that I stumbled across was uh, was just some Amazon review. And, and this, this guy said, I feel like this book is deeply subversive, <laughs> but I don't yet know how. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I just love that. It, it was like, wait, this book is making me think. Like I read a book about ninjas and it's changing me somehow or making me think in different ways that, that I, haven't, I haven't developed those muscles yet. Right. And and I, I love doing that for people. I, I love being like, yeah, yeah, it's a story about, you know, ninjas and killers and prostitutes and, and people who make horrible choices. And yet maybe <laughs> it's got something to say to you if, if you've got ears to hear. So that's With, fun for me. My wife and I have this uh, this thing that we'll do. We'll watch TV together and and we say that uh, the writer uh needs you to care about a character and then you take that character stick them in a tree and then set the tree on fire <laughs> and so we'll you know we'll we'll be watching a tv show and they're like well they just set the tree on fire you know right. so what i'm hearing from you is that you like to put the reader in that tree and then set the tree on fire <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah, so that's great I, yeah i like that i like that I, I i like that that's uh okay what are you gonna do now <laughs> yeah <laughs> right um Brent, when you first created this world of uh, of the Night Angel, was it was it the world that first ap appealed to you, or was it a particular character that then necessitated that the world form around them? Um, you know, maybe it's a chicken uh, egg kind of question, but but what came first for you? Well, for the, for for the Night Angel trilogy, it was. It was mostly it was mostly the character came first because I had uh, from the time I was 19, I started writing my first you know fantasy novel. Right. And I finally threw it away when I was 25 and was like, OK, I made some mistakes here. Also, it was about 220,000 words long and I was about halfway done and, <laughs> and was like, OK, you cannot write a 400,000 word novel as your first novel and ever get published. I actually had a very hard time getting published with a 155,000 word novel. Like people said, that's too long. I just don't love it enough. I'm going to pass. You know, it's great, but it's too long for me. Um, so I, I had written this novel, had some structural problems, so it'll never come out of the trunk. But this one character showed up in that novel and, uh, and he like saves, he like saves this girl but not for really for her sake. He's just pissed off about something else. And then he like 
kicks a bunch of people's asses and then he leaves. And, and it was like, wait, who the hell was that guy? And so w- 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 when I decided like, wait, this guy is a, he's a killer, but he's got some kind of a code. He doesn't really care about her exactly. He cares that other people are violating what he thinks is right, but he doesn't really explain what that is. And then he's just gone. And I was like, um, okay, I got to throw away this novel. What if I didn't throw away everything I've done? What if sort of the main events of this novel still happen? They're just 20 years in the future. So let's rewind the clock, take this character, figure out where he came from and what he did. And so it's like, okay, well, there's this town that they mentioned that's like the worst town and, and crime is totally rampant in that town. So that's scenario. Okay, let's, uh, I bet he grew up there. I bet he grew up there because how do you get, like, like my main problem was like, how do you get a moral assassin, you, you know, a moral killer? And, and my answer to that was, well, you'd have to have a kid in such a bad situation that it seems like a logical decision for him to take this horrible road out. Like all the other ways out for him are worse. And that's the only way I could see that happening. And then of course, like, what does it do to somebody if they're a moral person and they're trying to be an assassin? It's like, well, that's going to cause them all sorts of problems. So, uh, so, so, so it was, it was that process of rewinding the clock by 20 years, moving to a different city, a different part of the, of the world and being like, okay, this city has to be fundamentally corrupt. Um, all the, all the things that we set up to take care of children, you know, must be broken in this city right. because nobody's taking care of children. Uh, and okay. There's gotta be crime. There's gotta be all this. He's part of this group. Okay. So, so that was sort of the initial setup was like, I sort of already built a lot of the world, but the, but the environs of the city and the structure of the city was like, this has to be the worst possible environment where you have a basically good kid trying to survive in order to become what I, what I wanted him to become or what I had for him to become. So, so it was, it was a lot about the character uh, for, for this particular, um, in this situation with Night Angel. Um, Samuel asked an interesting question, and I'm I'm going to frame it a, a little differently than he said. Um, but there there have been um, some books uh, recently with some problematic issues uh, historically, culturally, and some of those have been updated. Um, you know, much to you know, much debate has gone on about whether you know you should. Um, you know, change with cultural sensitivities and, you know, th- there's sure. a, there's a whole conversation to be had around that. Um, but my question is because you do write characters that are kind of morally gray and um, who maybe don't, and, and by your own words and, and by that Amazon review, um, your work can be a little subversive and uh, you know, intentionally. So mm-hmm. do you ever worry that, some of the subversive nature of the stories you tell and some of the characters that you write and how they're, they're kind of morally, you know, all along the spectrum. And sometimes the same character is all over the spectrum. Do you ever worry that those characters or those situations you write might be misconstrued or, you know, maybe taken out of the context that you intend for them to be in? Maybe sure. Yes. Um, well, in, in, in one way, I like I have the luxury of writing to readers, which I think raises the bar a little bit. Like, like I think there's there's things in the books, certainly in the initial books, uh, in the, the initial Night Angel trilogy, that like I wouldn't put on screen. Cause there's, there's a difference to seeing things sure. than to hearing them described and like how far back you pull the camera and stuff can be very different than the image itself. The image can just be searing um, cause we are visual creatures. Um, right. Secondly, I, I think the audience is, you, you know, e- even with your kind of crazy people, it's like you get book crazy people, you, you know, oh, yeah. at least they can read, you, you know, they're right. engaging with the word. And and so I have, I have tended to be like, I'm going to trust you guys. And there are going to be people who misread it. And there are going to be people who, you know, maybe misread it until they run into the right critic who says, no, no, that's not what he was saying. Like, I see my name next to stuff that Durzo Blint says, you know, you know, life is meaningless you know, Brent Weeks, you know, <laughs> right. when we take a life, we take nothing of value, Brent Weeks. And it's like, yeah. okay, yes, a character of mine said that. 
And the yeah. whole conflict of, of the, even the first book is, is life meaningless? Is, is this, you know, just a contest and like, there's a bunch of total badass, but, it, but like, look at what it has done to his life to live this. Right. Way. It right. has left him with nothing and it, except being a badass and he doesn't even like it. It's like, so like you can read it wrongly and I can't, you know, I, I, I can't spend all my time dumbing it down or excusing it or, or, or like being like, right. by the way, folks, I don't think this is good. You know, do like <laughs> put little author notes. This is a bad choice. This right. is an ambiguous choice. I have some reservations about, it. you know, if w w once you do that, you stop making art and it's like, you've stopped um, giving people something that they can engage with. It's like, okay, I'm not writing this to, to preschoolers. I'm not, I'm not advocating, you know, like even with the initial book, it's like, okay, how do we sell this book? Well, the most important um, relationship is between the master and apprentice. So you could put a master and apprentice, you, you, you know, this leering, looming figure over this guy, but then it would look like a book for kids. Right. And so it's like, we didn't sell it that way. It's like, this is not a book for kids. It's a book with a kid in it but it's not for children to read. Right. And I've, I've heard from people, you know, because it's been out for a while now who read it at, at very early ages. And they said, well, I, I mostly went past all this stuff. Like I didn't notice the stuff yeah. that was, that was like later I was like, wow, that's, that's rough. I wouldn't have had it an 11 year old read that. So a <laughs> lot, of, a lot of people mercifully missed some of the stuff, yeah. which I tried to write some of it euphemistically so that you would, you, but so that younger people might read it, but, but there is just, there is just a huge amount of like, man, I, I think you've got to trust people. You've got to trust right. people to be like, you have a moral background and like, this should help you deal with that and, and work that through. And like, this is like, like, and that's where I tend to fall with, um, with, with rewriting those novels. It's like racism is bad. Okay. Yeah. We, we got that, you know, like right. using certain kinds of language, that's bad. And they didn't, they treated that differently, you know, years ago. And right. some of them, you know, some words were always slurs and some things have changed and they've been slurs at certain times. And, and sometimes people were, were very forward thinking to, to use language that now we'd say, Oh, that's not okay to say. And it's like, well, for that time, that was incredibly liberal. Yeah, right. <laughs> and it's like, Oh, that requires extra education for, for yeah. you to know that. But it also requires some trust. It's like, you know what? Like, like art is art is rough. You know, you, you read, you, you, you step into this other world. And part of the stepping into it is that things have not been tweaked for our sensitivities. That is not a weakness of it. That is the strength of it. It's like, if you don't like going into another world, don't read books. Just don't. It's not for you. You know, go to the most mainstream PG Hollywood thing and you will be coddled in, in, in a nice cloud of exactly what today values and and brought along and and never challenged. And some people really do want that. And like maybe there's there's certainly a time for comfort reads. There's certainly a time for comfort watches. There's times when you're like, man, I can't read something brutal right now. Look <laughs> at the Amazon reviews. It's like this one tore my heart out. And you just go. Yeah. Not for me right now. I can't handle that. You know, my dad just died, whatever. Right. I, I'm not going to read a book about that. It's like, okay, yeah. that's, that's great. But, but I, I think you really, um, I think you miss a lot of like, like, okay, if you want, you want to slap a thing in the front of a book to say there's these problematic things in it or, or, or there's this, it's like, okay, it doesn't get get in the way too much. Um, yeah. If the author was okay with it, it's like, okay, I wrote that. I wrote that in a way that I wouldn't write it. You know, I wrote it 25 years ago. I'd write it differently today because things have shifted. Let's change it. You know, that's fine. Yeah. Um, but but I, I do think it's like a slippery slope. It's like, man, like, like you know, Mark Twain, like like reading Huck Finn. It's like there's some offensive language in there. And it's kind of, that's the point. You're like, right. Like, right. it's like, oh, like, like even to say it, it's like, but like he's saying it, he's, he's saying like, are black people human? You know, it's like, well, duh. And yeah. you know, it's, it's like, but, but for the time, for his readership, you, you know, you have Huck Finn saying, well, to do, to do what we obviously can see is the right thing means I'm going to go to hell. Yeah. And he says, all right, then I'll go to hell. And it's like Mark Twain is shaking you by the neck and saying, right. don't you see how messed up you are? You Christians yeah. think you're going to, this kid is going to go to hell because he's helping a man. And it's like, 
Well, like, like it should blow your mind. And like, I don't think anybody can miss it if they actually read it and go, wait, wait, okay. I see that word that, that flags things for me. I don't yeah. like people using that word. I mean, I have, I have read stuff from earlier times and just been surprised when you're just like, whoa, that just showed up. Yeah, right. like, like, and, 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 and you, you know, and then you got to figure out like, is he using that to, okay. He only uses that when, when the bad guys are saying it. So right. he's sort of an enlightened guy who's, who's saying it. And then, you know, and then in a different book, it's like, oh, here he uses it all over the place. Right. Like, you know, and yeah. it makes you sort of feel, ah, that's, that's, that's too bad. Yeah. But, but you also go, okay, it was written in 1950. You, you, you know, when the guy refers to homosexuals, he doesn't do it in a way we think is appropriate now. Like, like, yeah. Well, it, does that ruin all of your enjoyment? And that's up to you. Maybe it does ruin all your enjoyment. But um, so, so I, I, I think art is complicated, and yeah. humanity is complicated, and societies change, and and we all know that. So, so I think I think that's a self education kind of yeah. thing rather than a. Well, and like you said a minute ago, this is not eleventh grade um, English class. You you can pick up any book you want and, and read. It's not an assignment, and. Mm-hmm. Maybe this is not the right time for that book, but put it on the shelf. Maybe come back to it in a month when when you're in a different headspace and, you know, maybe you have a different experience with yeah, it. Right, right. Let, let's talk craft for just a minute, Brent. Mm-hmm. Um, during um, during the, the writing of Lightbringer, where the story grew in the telling, um, did, did that experience or – maybe not that experience in particular, maybe other writing experiences. Has that changed the way that you physically write a story in, in your, your planning, your organizing, your editing, the, do you still approach it the same way? Do you still use the same, um, you know, computer software? If we just want to get just right, down to yeah. nuts and bolts, like has anything changed for you in the way you approach the job that you do? Yeah, I, I mean, I certainly think um, <clears throat> I certainly think that the the experience of having finished now two epic fantasy series with Night Angel and Lightbringer w- was really valuable to me. It's like, OK, why why did that grow? It's like, well, that grew because I had I had lots of conflicts for lots and lots of characters. They weren't all set to the same things. It was like, oh, I want to see more of what this guy does. I want to see more of what this guy does. I had lots of options and um, and a big, big world that I even – I didn't even get to explore all of it. You know, there, there, there's whole – sections of the magic we didn't really touch because none of the characters had you know that ability oh we don't really haven't gotten into really any orange drafters you you know it's like okay i'm not making up a character just to do that okay well i could have a (laughs) like stop adding characters stop adding characters um oh we haven't gone to this part of the world you know like there's all these other things that i i've made up but i i haven't i haven't shown you those yet it's like don't do that tell this story Bring it down. It became um, the Tom Clancy of epic fantasy. Yes, it's it, adding it, characters and subplots. Yes, yes. <laughs> you, it, it's like I, I think everybody who writes epic fantasy, it's like they like adding characters. They like more characters. They're good at it. They're good enough to get people to keep reading through the middle books. They like middle books. They, they're good right. at middle books. And it's like okay, that's a different skill set than tying it all together. And so, so I think having having strong endpoints of like, okay, this book is going to get to here and we're going to have, this is going to be the shape of this book. And I'm going to, so, so I, I outlined much more with this book than I've done actually for any book that I've ever written. Um, because I knew, I knew that I was taking on a, um, I, I was pushing the boundaries of, of, of certain forms. And I was like, okay, to do that, I need this strong spine so that we, as I'm playing these games, it's like, we're still obviously moving forward. There's lots of flags about how our progress is going so that you feel like, okay, this story ends. I want there to be more, you you know, I've, I've left some characters in places where you're like, wait, I, what, what's going to be next. But at the same time, it's like, okay, the story has ended. Like there was a question and it has now been answered. And like having that for each volume and having that build obviously to um, to a conclusion uh, rather than having it slightly more open 
uh, is something I learned. I, I think I've learned. I think I've learned it successfully. <laughs> uh, and, and, and then there is just that, like, there's always more to tell. There's always new characters that pop into your head and you're like, I want to tell about this woman. Oh my gosh. She's, she's got cancer and she's, she's dealing with this thing. And the, the magic that she's using is killing her, but she's got to use it because it, it helps her do, you know, X, Y, and Z. And, you know, it's like, honey, you're in book five bring it back. You know, it's like, right. but, but I've already got like so much with her. And then I think I can make her tie in. And it's like, okay, okay. But when you do that, like the characters that people already love are going to get less and less screen time. Right? right. And you're, Oh, okay. So figuring out that give and take between, um, between what readers are reading for and what they love and what you love because you've seen everything is, is I think, uh, an, uh, an important sort of, uh, perspectival flexibility that you need to have. Um, like, like I, 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 I think I can criticize gently, uh, you know, Robert Jordan, he spends mm -hmm. 200 pages with Bale Doman, the river merchant. And it's right. like, okay, well the river merchant is able to show you a lot of land and like, okay, so he can show you that he, and he moves some characters around a couple of times, but it's like, but I don't want 200 pages with Bale Doman river merchant. I, I don't right. care. I just don't care as a reader. And it's like, oh, well, Robert Jordan loved that character because he got to do things with that character and he lost sight of the difference between why are readers reading? And it's like, okay, I got, I got zero of Randall Thor in this book and I'm angry. It's like, yeah. okay, you need to give me a little bit more than that. It's like, so, so holding like the shape of the novel in your head and being like, there are characters you're not going to see as much as you want of it, but that's for a reason. And I've got, I've got that reason in mind and it's going to pay off. Um, and holding like that give and take between, between reader and author. It's like, okay, am I giving you what you came here for, but also right. giving you what I want to tell? Like, like, I think there's, I think that's a valid thing. And I don't think it's like, oh, well, I'm an artist and I just get to do whatever I want. It's like, fine, then don't publish the books. If it's really just for you, then put it, put it in your drawer and feel super satisfied at what a genius you are. And, you know, they can publish it when you're dead or something. It's like, yeah. no, no, no. We actually tell stories so that people receive them, I think. Right. And it becomes, uh, you know, this thing that you've created becomes bigger than you. And even though you're the creator and these things all originated in your head and in your heart, they once you put them out to the world, they they kind of become more than that. And it's very weird and it's and and it's very weird for a lot of writers to to come to that realization that that this thing that is so close to and dear to you mm -hmm. becomes kind of a community thing and it right. it's a weird thing that happens in writing that you know once you turn it loose to the world it it takes on a life of its own absolutely i i i think there's like I've been thinking about like, like, why do we allow writers? And, and there was this, there was this time in Western, you know, civilization where people sort of said like, why do we let people tell us lies? You know, it's, it's like, these are lies. Like none of this is true. And writers joke, oh, I'm a professional liar. It's like, why do we allow that? And, and the reason that they ultimately, you, you know, the Puritans banned theater from the stage for a while, while, while Shakespeare was writing, it's like uh, Cromwell came in and, and it's like, you, you guys can't do this. This is lies, period. And Shakespeare went off and he, you know, he wrote some poems. He did all right. So, so, so he, yeah. he, he was OK. Um, <laughs> turned out he could write poetry, too. Jerk. Um, but, 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 but the reason why we allow writers to tell lies is we do it to tell the truth. And so I think when you when you pull people out of their world and you put them into some other character who they have nothing in common with, it's like somehow that casts light if it's done well and it's done honestly and it's done in a real way on their own lives in, in ways that are, that are kind of mystical. And, and it's amazing. Like that, 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 that actually helps people, you know, having people tell you, you helped me, your books helped me through a really dark time in my life. It's like, why did that happen? Well, it's because Night Angel is set in a really dark universe and yet there's hope. And it's like, okay, so, so that, that little core of hope, they were able to say, this guy's honest, like crap happens. And sometimes we don't know why. 
Yeah. And we can all acknowledge that truth and not explain it away and say, oh, there's a there's a greater purpose. There's a greater plan. It's all going to be fine, which is what we tend to do. And, and especially uh, Americans tend to be very optimistic and like, it's going to be great. It's going to be fine. You're going to come out of this stronger than ever. And it's like, no, it just sucks sometimes. <laughs> or, or, or maybe you'll come out of it stronger than ever, you know, 30 years from now. But right. something awful just happened to you. So so I try to I, I try to put that in my world. It's like something awful can happen. And yet there's still some hope. There's still some way to push through. And there's characters who model that. And so readers react to that. And, and it's like they didn't have anything in common with Kyler or with or with the other characters, except this thing of like, I've experienced the darkness and somehow I push through. And these books meant something to me. So you're right. It's it's a it's a mystical thing. It's it's strange. It's wonderful. I don't totally understand it. It's it's uh, it's daunting. You know, when 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 readers say that, it's like, is that something special I did or could that have been any book? And it's like, right. I don't know, actually, I, but I'm glad it was my book. So I, I'm going to keep doing the best I can. And, and uh, you know, lying as beautifully as I can, telling t- telling telling the truth through telling <laughs> great lies and uh, and doing that artfully and well. Well, I hope you lie to me for for a long, long time, Brent. The new book, Night Angel Nemesis, is available everywhere now. Um, I uh, I have read the the arc, uh, but yeah. I am getting the audio book, and I'm going to yeah. uh, listen to it this weekend. I have loved all of your books in audio. It's a different experience. Um, yeah. And I just love them. So I can't oh, wait to dig into this. Simon one. Vance does a heck of a job. So yes, I, that, 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 that was a, a beautiful thing when, when he came across my books. So that was, that was great. It's great to work with him. Absolutely. So. Um, Brent, your, your website uh, is brentweeks.com. Just, yep. Just brentweeks.com. I I'm on Facebook and I'm actually not on Facebook a ton. Well, you, you know, I sort of did yeah. the in the ramp up. I, I, I was, I'm trying to focus on the, Focus on the work and not on, not on things that, you know, annoy me. <laughs> so, well, good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. So, so, so I, I try to not be on social media very much, even though my job sometimes requires it. And, you, you know, you do have these like lovely little glimmers of light when you're on there and people are wonderful. And then you have other stuff that's like, oh man, I need to not be on here. So, so, uh, <laughs> but, but, but I'm, I'm, I am on Facebook. I, I do check in every so often. Uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, I, I actually just started a Discord channel. Uh, so that nice. So there wasn't a, uh, uh, a big behemoth that wanted to charge me every time I wanted to talk to people. So, so hopefully I'll start uh, figuring out how to do that better and, and awesome. put all my stuff there. So like, if you want to come see my stuff, you could just find it one place that's this simple. So right. trying to do all those things, but yeah, otherwise I'm just, I'm working on the next book and that's my, that's my main thing. I try to keep the main thing, the main thing. We'll and I'll be, we'll... uh, I'll be writing the next one. Excellent. We'll link all that up to make it easier for folks to find you. Brent, Always a pleasure catching up. Thank you so much for taking time. Well, thanks so much, Hank. It's, it's, it's great to talk to you. Always. That's our episode for today. There's so much more to come as we talk to authors about the craft of writing, but also the business of publishing. Be sure to subscribe to the StoryCraft Cafe podcast in your favorite podcast app so that you never miss an episode. The StoryCraft Cafe is made possible by Dabble. Writing a book is challenging. Your writing tool should not be. Dabble is an easy-to-use online writing tool packed with helpful features that allow beginning novelists and published authors to create amazing stories. Visit us at dabblewriter.com and start your free trial today. Thanks for listening.